Hi, everyone. Uh, and I, I want to thank the Jazoon organizers for bringing me and a couple other speakers all the way from, uh, from California. So this is actually where I come from. I, uh, I'm a digital nomad, and I travel all over the world writing code and uh, building out the product for, for my company. I show this to you because you should get in touch with me. I'll probably be traveling through wherever you might live at some point in the next couple of years. So just a little about the company I work for, uh, the obligatory plug. I, uh, I build a product that helps customers in the United States manage their cash flow and reach their financial goals. So we, we help our average customer save about $12,000 a year through uh, doing all the annoying stuff like calling the cable company and the cell phone provider to negotiate the rate down and uh, you know discover found money that, uh, that can be saved and put to something a little bit more useful. So from, from a development standpoint, uh, I, do, I do a lot of open source work, and I'm particularly drawn to opinionated frameworks. Uh, my, my gateway framework was Rails, and this was the first opportunity for me to see uh, a, a piece of technology that enabled me to get a whole lot done with minimal effort. It was, it was wonderful to see that in a weekend or in uh, a, a hackathon, I could put together something that looked, you know, like a polished product without having to set up a whole bunch of the usual thing that one has to do uh, when, when working with something like, um, like Java or PHP, at least back, you know, 10 years ago. So from, from Rails, I, I started working with Ember when I, when I began working at Yahoo, and uh, I was the, the UI architect of their ads and data division until a couple months ago when I started working for this, uh, this startup. And we, we, we then saw further benefits of using an opinionated framework. There we had you know, 115 developers uh, working on UI in my division. And the, the ability to take people from one team and move them to another team uh, and have them start being productive immediately, the ability to share code from one project to another, uh, this, this, this was really, really powerful uh, in contrast to what had been done before where every team lead of, uh, of a dozen or so products kind of picked their own tech stack and oftentimes this was uh, sort of a Frankenstein of you know, backbone views and flat iron director for routing and some jQuery widgets and a big grunt file that only one person knew how to, how to work with. Sounds like, from the chuckling, none of you know what I'm talking about here. So uh, lately, I've been using Phoenix, which is uh, a framework built on Elixir. It's, it, some people look at it as sort of the next evolutionary step uh, of, of Rails. It's another opinionated framework, highly functional, but, but oriented towards developer productivity, where you have things like code generation and uh, a, a great story around testing that just help you get things set up uh, extremely quickly. So uh, today's talk, it's going to be about a couple things, but mostly uh, this here. The idea of having a single code base and being able to reach native mobile app stores, being able to send a desktop app as an executable to your customers, and then also being able to, to do the typical things, reach the all the various form factors uh, on the web. So one code base, write it once, run it anywhere. So uh, in the desktop world, this isn't really uh, a, a, new, a new idea, right? Because we already have the browser on, on a desktop. This, we, we use very powerful browsers like Chrome and Safari. And there are uh, many popular apps that, that already leverage uh, HTML5 technology. So we've got Spotify, uh, Slack, I'm sure a lot of people use Slack, Atom, GitHub's code editor. These under the hood are, uh, amongst other things, HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And they provide a first class experience to their users, right? Many people using these have no idea that they're built using web technology. And this is because they're using the, the web browser in its most powerful form, uh, just 
kind of embedded into the app itself. So this is not really, not controversial, and you can, you can we've been able to get a first-class desktop experience with web technology, um, you know, especially within the last couple of years. Mobile is a little bit of a different story. So in 2007, uh, every, the whole world changed. Apple introduced the iPhone, and uh, in 2008, they announced the ability for developers to start writing their own apps. So people started writing native apps. And then a little bit later, uh, we had some mobile web frameworks come out that aimed to provide an app-like experience using web technology. Does anyone have experience with, with uh, Senja Touch or jQuery Mobile? All right, so keep your hand up if you feel like what you built was, was great and really felt like a mobile. All right, no hands up, awesome. So uh, it was sort of a, an interesting idea, but ahead of its time. And even as things started getting better, like uh, a couple years later, uh, and, and big companies started to try to leverage web technology to have this idea of, you know, of, of a single code base or some portion of code shared between web and a, a native, you know, deployable app, uh, we ended up with things like this. So Facebook in 2012 just publicly came out and said HTML5 does not work, and it, it was sort of go native or go home, right? And even to this day, you can see that uh, some, to, to some degree, there is a substantial focus on technology to build native mobile apps and to get away from the idea of doing something like using React.js, not React Native, with something like Cordova to get to the App Store, right? So this is, Ryan is like a huge proponent of React and uh, this was a common opinion coming out of their recent conference that the focus, it seemed to be that all the innovation is around React Native, which is just building, you know, Android and Swift views. It's, it's different from the web. So one of the arguments I'm making today is that a lot has changed since 2012, since sort of the big rejection of hybrid app technology. These were the most powerful phones that were out in 2012. And this is just a, a Geekbench uh, benchmark, so had some correlation with browser performance can, can be inferred here. Uh, and you see we've got 215 and 214, whatever that means. And if we look at what's available today, uh, we have devices that are 10 times more powerful. And if you look at even the premium devices like the new iPad Pros that are out, those are in the 3000s. So we have a lot more power at our disposal and uh, some of the performance problems that we were seeing when we started using Senja Touch and jQuery Mobile, those, uh, we, we don't have to deal with those anymore. We don't, they're not inevitable. We can find ways of, of providing a first class uh, experience using only web technology. So an additional selling point of using web technology is shelf life. So when the iPhone 5 came out, we ended up with apps that look like this, uh, where we had beautiful little black bars around the app that was designed for earlier iPhones. And in order to fix this, you actually have to go in and recompile this app and potentially set different auto layout constraints. And it doesn't, it's not adaptive. It's not designed like a web app, right? In the web app world, we build uh, things for a, a continuum of browser dimensions because that's just the reality we live in. And here, you know, we're people who are building for a fixed screen size. So I have I have web apps like this that I made in you know 2004 that are still up and running and active today. And I think the same claim cannot be made for the earliest uh, mobile apps. I haven't had to touch this. It's still working perfectly. So the shelf life of the web because it's so ubiquitous and because we still have people on old browsers and we, we can't let go of technology in the same way that we can just say, oh, a new iOS SDK came out and you need iOS 9 for this. You know, we can, uh, we, we, we can put something out there and rely that it's gonna keep working for, uh, for many, many years. So the point is that it's, it's time to take another look. Uh, th there's another reason that uh, it's important we consider web technology. 
And I'm just going to click this button to, all right, who knows what this is? So this, this is called an interstitial. It's, it's an interruption in a web experience where we're prompted to download a native app. And it's, it's interesting that in all of these discussions amongst uh, using different web framework technologies where we're talking about 500 kilobytes uh, of JavaScript versus 50 kilobytes of JavaScript, here we, we regularly have to download many, many megabytes of native code in order to get, uh, get the experience we're looking for. So here I have a side-by-side -side comparison of Yelp, a popular app that has both a mobile web experience and a native experience. And if you think about the time that's required to get where you're going uh, after you click a link, it, we're, we're already there on the right-hand side, which is the mobile web experience. And by the way, not trying to pick on Yelp here, but it's very basic. Right? It's meant to reach the, even the most basic Android dev devices. There are no animations. Not a lot has been invested in this compared to the richness of their mobile app, which is still downloading. Uh, it's, you know, it really, by the time you get to the end of this, and I'm not even going to let this play through because at the end I have to type in my username and I have to go into one password to get my password and come back, and then once I'm there, uh, I've lost all context of the original link that I've clicked on, so I go back to the link and I click on that, and then finally I am seeing basically the same screen that I, he I have here on the right. So uh, this, is, this is a big problem. And in fact, Google, uh, less than a year ago, announced that they're penalizing websites that interrupt the user's experience trying to reach their content. They're, they're downranking that. They're saying that this is less engaging. And they, they came to this conclusion uh, after conducting some experiments of their own using a similar technique as this. They found that. Uh, when they had an interstitial in place, had this drop down saying download our mobile app with very light small text at the bottom saying click here for the mobile web experience. So they found that 69% uh, of their users just bounced out. They just gave up. They clicked on the link and they said, screw it, forget it. 9% of users actually installed their app. And the remaining 22% ended up actually going through and using the mobile web experience. So still, more than a two to one ratio, people wanted to go through the mobile web experience and to avoid downloading the app. All right, so we're still going here. We finally downloaded. Looks like we got to add some notifications here and log in with Facebook. We'll just leave that going. So when, when uh, Google removed this interstitial, they found that uh, a negligible drop in app installation happened. It was like 2%, right? So they had the same app installs, but a 20% engagement increase in, uh, oh, it looks like I had some grease on my finger or something. My, my touch ID didn't work. So uh, they, they saw that a 20% engagement in their mobile web experience happened. So they had more engagement total. They didn't have a reduction in app installs. And so it's clear that mobile web is important. All right, all right, I, you know, I think we can just give up on this. So first class mobile, ex mobile web experience is more important than ever, and uh, the question is how can we make this easy, right? We see that, that uh, people are investing a lot in developing a great native mobile app, right? It takes, it takes a Swift developer, and it takes a lot of polish to get, get things right. So how can we have a similar experience on the mobile web, have that richness, uh, without you know, having to, to choose between these two technologies? What if we could have a rich experience on mobile web that happens to also be deployable to the App Store? And we can kind of have the best of both worlds. Then we can have the improved engagement. And then if users wish to download your app so that they can get notifications or so they can you know, retain their login state longer or, or something like that, you know, that would sort of be the, the brass ring there. That would be having, having everything. Today I'm going to talk about Ember.js as a, as a potential solution to this problem. Uh, so who here has heard of Ember? Great. Awesome. And who's used it before? Fantastic. That's, this is my workshop buddies over there. 
So uh, Ember has a focus on developer productivity, and what this means is that while things like, uh, like performance are very, very important, uh, we, we kind of treat those as a second priority next to people being able to build things quickly, iterate quickly, and get something out soon. Uh, Ember is branding itself as sort of the SDK for the web, and what this means is you're never going to see Ember native. We're never going to go in a direction that says we're, we're about building Swift views and taking Ember code and transforming that into what will eventually be a completely native app with no web technology baked in. Ember is about aligning with web standards and uh, really strictly doing the best we can in the context of, of a browser or a browser-like thing. And, and the idea behind uh, an opinionated framework and how that drives productivity is that you can, you can focus on decisions that make your product unique and special rather than uh, the endless debates over should we use Grump, Grunt or should we use Gulp or Webpack or uh, you know, should we use Babel to transpile our modules or Esperanto or TypeScript. And you know, all of these, when you get down to it, your users are, are not going to care. Right, these are, these are just sort of debates over internal tooling, and once you get something in place, and it works, and it does what you need to do, um, it's, it, the opinion of the Ember community is, let's, let's focus on empowering developers to like not even worry about that, and then they have sort of a turnkey set of things that just work. So uh, what, what developers love about Ember is that there are solid conventions that, that the framework is built around. Uh, it, it is designed with ambitious apps in mind. So the, the origin of Ember is from a framework called Sprout Core, which was originally used by Apple for the, the web-based iCloud experience. And this is a very rich experience with a lot of animations and transitions. And uh, you know, it almost seems like one of these web applications that uh, you can't believe that there's HTML under it. It's just so rich and, and so engaging. Uh, so Ember has a commitment to forward compatibility, and what this means is not that you have a guarantee that your code will just work in future versions, but that uh, until there's a major version increment, you should be able to upgrade smoothly as new framework versions come out. And there's a six-week release cycle, and so there's sort of little tiny changes that come out, and you get deprecation warnings in the event that there, something's about to go away, and as long as you take care of those within 12 weeks or so, uh, you should be able to benefit from all of the advancements that go on in the framework. So everyone in the core team must work on real apps. And uh, what, what this means is that they feel the pain of what they're building. They feel uh, the, the consequences of their decisions. And they're in the same boat as the users. And this encourages that we don't have um, what sometimes, you know, with, with I know in, with certain Java technologies that I used, it felt like there were some ivory tower architects that really, you couldn't believe that they'd even attempted to use this stuff. It was so awful to try to work with it. Uh, and yet, you know, they're, they're saying this is the right way to do it. So, uh, and, and Ember, because it's opinionated, because it has such strong conventions, it, uh, I'm making a statement that it, it addresses the whole problem. And by that, I mean that you have all of these different components that fit together to form you know, the tools that you can use to build your app. You have the framework, you have uh, a great CLI set of build tools, uh, a bunch of libraries that, that assist in providing a rich experience, um, as well as patterns that help you leverage third-party code within seconds, right? And we're gonna see how that works. All right, so, so the way I'm gonna actually show you Ember, because it's such a big uh, set of technologies, I'm just going to build something for you on the screen. But first, I want to talk about two, two pieces of technology that are going to let us sort of leap out of the browser. The first is Cordova. And here is a simple diagram of how Cordova works. <laughs> so here's a simpler diagram. The idea is that you have a piece of native code, right? This is like Objective-C or Swift or Java in the case of Android and you have a piece of web code. And under the hood, you're using AJAX to essentially have what, what amounts to RPC calls, where 
the web-based piece is sending a signal to the native piece, and the native code is doing something and sending something back to the web-based piece. And you're just using the same network technology that we use to, commu uh, to communicate between client and server all within your device. And so what you're doing is you're, shif you're shipping your JavaScript and your CSS and your HTML along with uh, this native wrapper around it and any plugins that you may have. Uh, you're, you're sending that all to the App Store and the user is downloading it and it's right there. So this is essentially like a supercharged web experience where the user doesn't even have to download any of your assets. They come packaged in your app. They just start talking to the API directly. The desktop equivalent, or one of, one of the equivalents, is called Electron. This is a project that is maintained by GitHub and seems to be increasingly the popular option for building desktop apps with web technology. Uh, if you use Atom, GitHub's text editor, or Visual Studio Code, Microsoft's new code editor, these are built on top of Electron. And the idea here is that you have your typical UI libraries running side by side with Node.js libraries, right? Since you're all, you're in the world of JavaScript, you don't really need this bridge that we have in the Cordova world to communicate between two completely separate components, one of which is interpreted, the other is compiled. This is all JavaScript. And so you can have a much more seamless um, architecture here where you're just having JavaScript running everywhere. And Essentially, what's happening is your app is packaged within its own Chromium shell. Chromium is the open source flavor of Chrome. It's a lot of Chrome comes from the Chromium project. Um, and you can look into that later if, if you're interested. But uh, it's essentially you're, you're shipping your app with its own dedicated web browser that will just start loading your app immediately. And you can disable navigation. And so it sort of uh, forces the user into that web-based experience. And unbeknownst to them, they're using a browser, and it seems like an app. So you, there, there's the ability to add a lot of native functionality to this, including uh, menu bars and right-click menus and writing to the file system and uh, network calls that wouldn't be available in a browser-based environment. And so really, anything you can do in the Node world, you can pretty much do in the Electron world. What you end up shipping to your users is an .exe or a .app. It's an executable. They have no idea that this thing is web-based unless they start Opening, up, opening it up. So how do you ember these things? Just like this. So the, one of the strengths of the ember ecosystem is because everyone uses the same build tools and because we're all building around the same conventions, the way you set up your project for Electron or Cordova or this third plugin here, which is uh, a material design uh, UI kit that I maintain, it's it's just one line to install it. And this is Ember install is like a little layer on top of NPM install that just gives us the ability to set things up and to apply some default configuration to the project. And uh, it's, it's just sort of like NPM install plus plus. But uh, so, so I've actually done all of this in advance before we start coding so I don't pwn myself with uh, an NPM issue on, on live uh, chat here. So there's a really well-organized ecosystem of Ember add-ons. Feel free to check it out. Uh, they're, they're scored by popularity and activity and test coverage and number of contributors and when do, whether they work with server-side rendering. You can really easily determine sort of what is uh, sort of an amateur spike on an idea versus a very well-maintained uh, piece of code. So with that, we're about halfway through our time here. Um, I'd like to start building something with you guys. So this is what we're going to end up with. It's a really simple app because I'm going to try to build it from scratch right in front of you. And what we've got here uh, on your left is a mobile app running in the iOS simulator. Uh, here we've got a native, native desktop app running in Electron. And up here, if you can see the address bar and all of my ad blocker plugins up there, that's, that's the same app running in Chrome. So we're going to have this single app, but we're going to be able to sort of build to all of these different targets. The first thing we're going to want to address is routing. So if you've, uh, any of you have worked with, with server-side technologies, a router is sort of what you use to take a URL. Uh, and you know, if, if the user sends a request to a particular URL, you delegate a controller or something to handle that response. 
in the UI, it's, it's similar in that we're responding to state changes of the URL and routing our, uh, and moving our application into the appropriate state to match that URL. So if we're at the index page, we may look, uh, we, we may be in a particular state and then we go to a different URL and we sort of pivot to another state. And uh, this tree here, these are what we call routes. They just assist us in transitioning between application states. So these take care of loading data from an API, um, setting up any authentication checks that we need to do, et cetera. And uh, as we navigate around, we can just think of this as sort of pivoting on a tree and different things load only when necessary, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to switch to mirror here so I don't crane my neck too much. So what I've got here is a very, very, very empty uh, Ember project. And hopefully everyone can see. So I've just added like a tiny bit of structure and a little bit of CSS. I'm going to get rid of that bar there. And so here's, here's an example of, uh, of what we're working with here. It's uh, Ember's markup language, Ember's templating language. It's called Handlebars. If you've used Mustache, this probably looks familiar. The idea is that it's a superset of HTML where you can have data bindings that uh, just keep data and DOM in sync. You can have handlebars helpers, and then later we'll get into components. But here you can see that if I, uh, let me see if I'm running live here. I am. So if I make a change here and save it, uh, Ember CLI, which is the build tool that everyone uses that will pick up on the change, rebuild all of the JavaScript, transpile it from ES6 to ES5, and then send a signal through live reload to tell the browser to refresh. All of that's happening uh, behind the scenes, and we can actually see that this took like less than two seconds, which is um, oftentimes it's quite a bit faster than that, so depending on what you change. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do with, with routes is we'll, uh, I, want, I want some routes that look like this, right? So uh, we're going to build like a GitHub repository browser that lets us drill into various organizations and see the list of repos. So I want some URLs that look like this. I'm going to use Ember CLI to generate, um, generate these routes. And what this will do is set up the appropriate ES6 modules. And it will also generate a passing unit test for each route. It'll stub it out so that it's very easy for me to add something real in there. So we'll go back to Ember CLI here. And I'll make this quite a bit bigger. And I'll just do ember new route, oh, sorry, ember generate route index. This is just like index HTML, index.html. It's, it's sort of like the slash of my app. And uh, what I want on index.html is my list of organizations. And I'm going to be able to click on those organizations and see the list of repositories. And so I'm going to call that route for the list of repositories in an organization org repos. And let's add one more drilling into an individual repo. I'm just going to delete the S and hit Enter. And if we look at what's happening here, uh, we, we can see that a file has changed, a file is added, a uh, JavaScript module, a handlebars template is added. That's sort of the base level template for that URL that corresponds to that URL. And then Ember CLI picks up on the fact that files have changed and does its rebuild thing. So uh, let's, let's flesh that out a little bit. I'm going to close this and go to uh, index.hbs, and we'll call this uh, index. And then we'll go back to application.hbs, which is sort of like the wrapper around our whole app. And I'm just going to delete um, the, the stuff we put there. All right, we have a build error because I deleted an H2 tag. So just, just to give you guys um, an additional unexpected benefit here, uh, there's an HTML linter built into this tool chain. And so I deleted this H2, and it says, the closing tab tag div on line 6 did not ma match the open let tag H2 on line 4. This is like extremely explicit feedback. I can absolutely find where this error is and fix it. So um, 
this is part of helping developers be productive, having tooling that gives them a clear signal about what's, what's going right and what's going wrong. All right, so now I'm at this index URL, and we say, uh, we see that's what my URL is. Sorry, the address bar is too small. Let me see if we can hide, hide. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. All right. Oh. Wow. All right, so we've got index, and then uh, we've got our other routes there. So we can go to uh, org repos, and I want it to look like this. Org one, two, three repos. And all we'll have to do to uh, define the way this URL maps to this route is go into our router and say, this org route has a path of org ID, just like that. And we'll call it actually organization ID. And it's saying cannot get org123 slash repos. Uh, do, do, do. Org, org, org. Did I? Maybe I need to refresh. Oh, uh, this seems like it should work. Let's see. Org one, two, three. Maybe my server went down here. This is one of the dangers of a live coding talk. Never goes totally smoothly. Repos. All right, we're going to go to the next step and uh, fill that in in just a sec. So those routes are not working. They will start working in just a sec, promise. So the, the next thing I want to, to mention is this thing called the Ember Inspector. So it's a Chrome plugin that is also maintained along with the framework and the data persistence library and the animation tooling uh, that helps us probe into application state. Right? It helps us see what exactly may be going wrong. And uh, it, it gives us a whole bunch of functionality here. And all, all you have to do is install the Chrome plugin, and then you can go to this Ember tag, Ember tab here in the inspector. And for example, we can see the number of routes that are registered. And you can see here's my org route, and I've got org repos there, and it's looking for path that looks like that. I think that this is just not saving. That's the problem. All right. I'm going to reset to a working branch here, just so we can keep moving along here. the CLI died here. All right, so we've got a router that works here now. 
So I'm just going to walk you guys through step by step rather than live coding because we're running out of time here. So uh, we can use the Ember inspector to see which, uh, which route is currently active. And we can actually use it to um, grab various objects like controllers and templates and inspect scope. Right? We can grab one of these objects and see what's going on under the hood. So if we just want to see what's happening in our application route, we just need to click this little dollar sign E. We go to the console, and we can do E, get, and then route name. And it'll tell us application. And so this is particularly useful when you're dealing with a complex single page app that may have hundreds or thousands of different modules. It's, um, it's very hard to kind of uh, get lost in that world where you're, you're trying to keep everything discrete with its own role. Uh, very nice to be able to grab hold of a particular thing. So the next thing, uh, so I want to open up the floor now to give everyone a chance to, to ask me about routing and about Ember add-ons and about Ember CLI before we move on to the next thing. All right. So Ember data is Ember's persistence library. Uh, it's based on the same principles as Redux. And uh, there's also a library in the Angular world called Angular Data. So I just say this to point out that this idea of unidirectional data flow and having a central atom of state and having um, user interaction sort of travel in one direction and updates to data traveling in the other direction to avoid uh, complicated feedback loops, that's not unique to a particular technology. That's something that everyone is converging on. So the idea with Ember Data is that you have models that define prototypes for records, right? So models are like record factories. And you have these two other types of objects called adapters and serializers. And these are what you use in order to define how to talk to your API. And I phrase it this way deliberately because the whole advantage of, of using an approach like the way Ember Data um, you know, directs you to, to, to solve this problem is you set up Ember Data according to your API conventions, and then you should be able to just interact with your store and say, give me this record and use this relationship and traverse, you know, go through this relationship and get this set of records. And uh, you should never have to be dealing with the particulars of talking to your API as you build that new functionality, right? So you define it all in one place in general. And then hopefully, ed everyone has different APIs, and Ember can work with any API. Uh, but you just you ha hopefully, you have some conventions and some consistency. And uh, that, that's where Ember data can be uh, quite strong. So I'll, I'll show you the Ember data piece of this app. Um, here's what a model looks like. So we've just got two attributes here uh, and two string attributes and then a has many relationship to a different model. And uh, th this is by default an async relationship, meaning that if you wanted to get the list of repositories owned by an organization, uh, you, that, the first time you ask for that data, you will get a promise back. Everyone know what a promise is? It's an, it's an eventual value, right? It's something that you can attach to and almost like listen for the event where the promise finally has the value that it's retrieved from an API or from some other asynchronous operation. And, uh, but, but it's a great way of, of modeling things so that you don't have to worry about actually sending that query out. The data might be there already cached in your UI, or it might not be fetched yet, but you, you don't need to let that complexity bleed into the rest of your app. So here's what an, ad an adapter looks like. So, uh, oops, wrong file. Uh, and here you can see I'm just defining a, uh, some particulars about my API. I've got um, a host, I've got a namespace, which is just something appended after the host name. And then here, I'm just customizing AJAX options. This is just to demonstrate that you can, there, there are places where you can apply customization as needed. Here, uh, the default content type that I should be sending along with my API requests. Um, 
needs to be altered a little bit, and so there's a hook where you can do basically just that and not have to customize anything further. So now I'd like to talk about components a little bit. This is a hot topic. So who, who here has been using web components for like three or four years? All right, most of you are wrong. So who's been using this for three or four years? This is a web component. Under the hood, this is what Chrome is doing. So you have a placeholder element. Uh, you have a place to actually write. You have some classes that are applying style. Uh, so this is, this is what has been inside the browser and hidden from us for ages. And only now are we kind of starting to have tools where we can have our own language, our own uh, vernacular for describing you know, this is the way my app looks. So in the Ember world, uh, components look like this. So we use, we use handlebars, we use curlies, and a pound sign for an open tag and a slash sign for a closed tag. But we can nest these just as if we were using, you know, angles. And uh, what, what we've got here is a material design card. And so this, this code here is what we're seeing when we look in our app at Something like this. this. Just this white rectangle here with a title, right? So if we look back at the code, organizations is the title, and we've got a content area, and then a collection, and then we're using each, which is a declarative way of kind of expressing a for loop almost. And then within this each, we have the context of a particular item, almost like we're passing a callback to each, like the array.foreach method, if you guys have used that. And then we're creating links within that. All right, so Ember components are n starting now and even more in the future, very, very performant. Uh, in the uh, a conference last week, the flagship conference of the Ember community, we got a peek at the new rendering technology that's coming out, and thousands of components on the screen are rendering at 60 frames per second, which is roughly three times the performance of React. Uh, under similar conditions. So any questions for me on components or on Ember data? Anything? Personal questions? All right. So Liquid Fire is another piece of the Ember ecosystem, and it's what we use for animations, right? It's, it's how we can have this richness that I was talking about. Going back to the Yelp app where clicking on links would just be like a slam transition into the next page, and uh, it, it, it doesn't feel like a mobile app. It doesn't feel like what users want in, in you know, a more intimate form factor. So the idea of Liquid Fire is that it, it hooks directly into the router, and you can just say basically that when you're transitioning from this screen to this screen, or you can use things that are akin to regular expressions to apply some criteria, but basically you just say, when this criteria is met, this is the transition I wish to take. And if we look at the result, we have a really nice uh, transition between pages. It's quite fluid. Right, Ember Rails. All right, and the last things I want to talk about is going back into Cordova and Electron. So we've got this app, and now we want to desktopify it, or we want to mobilify it. So nothing up my sleeves. All, all I did was install a couple plugins so that I didn't have to download those on conference Wi-Fi. Um, but I'm going to show you how we can get this app into a mobile app. So I'm going to kill my Ember CLI server and just run Ember Cordova build. And this, uh, this is a command, this Cordova colon build. This is a command that this plugin added to Ember CLI. So you can extend Ember CLI to deploy to different targets or to do different things. So here we're seeing build succeeded. I'm going to open, which is just a shortcut for Give me Xcode. And what we have here is a project. 
And if we look inside, we've got some Swift stuff, but more importantly, a www folder that has what looks to be some JavaScript and some material design icons and some fonts and stuff. That, that is the web part of our Cordova app. And we're going to just run it on the simulator here, and it should just work. Oop. Well, that's a problem here. Let's, let's scale that down. All right. Well, it's a little grainy. Let's bump up a little bit. So now we click on a link, and we have a really nice transition. Click on a link, and a really nice transition. And so now we've got the web form factor. And you can tap into everything that Cordova offers, which includes integrating with the camera, um, native push notifications. Uh, you can add events to calendars. Basically, as, as people write these Cordova plugins, you, you can tap into any native functionality. You just have to write the little Swift piece and then you know, the JavaScript piece and have them communicate over, uh, over basically Ajax. All right, awesome. So we have our mobile app, just with, with one line there. And let's look at the desktop app. So I'm just going to turn off Cordova. That's all I'm doing there. Uh, Ember Electron, another command that an, a plugin added to Ember CLI. So we can see that it's building and should spit out a native app. So you can see here I've got Electron running, and I can customize that icon if I wanted to. Uh, but clicking on these things will have the same rich experience that we're looking for, right? Additionally, if I were then to go, uh, let me try something here. Get this. I just want the code and the desktop app side by side. Right, so this is the desktop app, not a browser. If I go to the repos list and I add something like this, uh, and hit save. You actually have live reload as you're building this, this desktop app. So you can iterate on it like you would if you were working in Chrome, because under the hood, this is Chromium, uh, except you're distributing a .app or a .exe. So especially if you're thinking about like internal tools and you're a web developer and you want a desktop app where you can like take in a file and process it and write out some other file, this is a great option here, where you can just use JavaScript and a few node libraries and build it just like it's a web app. All right, so just to wrap things up here, um, what, what do we take away from this? Well, the first is that um, browsers are continuously moving towards becoming a richer platform for us to build on, right? They started as document viewers, and now the demand is higher for us to provide a rich experience on the web. And every year, especially in the last two years, we've gotten major advancements in terms of the language and uh, big performance improvements in terms of what uh, like Safari and Chrome can do. And building for the web is, uh, is more important than ever, and it certainly should not be overlooked in favor of going straight to a native mobile app. Every, like Google has seen this, and many other companies as well, that uh, you can get an existing customer to download your mobile app, but if you're looking for engagement, people sharing things via links, it, you really need to have a first-class experience on the web. So uh, what, what I've shown you here is that using third-party code is, is easier with Ember than with basically any other uh, modern framework. And the reason is it's the high degree of uh, it's so opinionated, and the conventions are so strong, and everybody's on the same page. This is not to say that it's better, but it's more turnkey, because uh, everyone's 
got the same build tools. Everyone's app is structured the same way. Everyone's configuration is in the same place. And so it's very easy to do more and to give people a, a more advanced starting point when, when setting up something like Electron or Cordova. And, and finally, I, I want uh, you guys to consider that the more time you spend on, uh, you, the, the more of your focus that's directed on making your app what, is, uh, what your customers want, right? Doing what makes your product special, that's going to turn into uh, business and that's going to turn into user growth and you know, popularity of your product. And largely, this time spent uh, dealing with nuts and bolts and bike shedding on whether you should use tabs or spaces or all of these other sort of endless debates where the importance of the outcome is, is far less than uh, you know, the amount of time that we spend talking about it. That, that is something you should try to focus less on and, and aim for adopting conventions and doing things in a standard way and it makes scaling easier, it makes sharing code easier, and it makes building community around a technology um, easier and more productive. And thanks everyone for your attention.